Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let folks come on into the webinar today. Got just a couple minutes before we get started. I'm going to let folks join the webinar here. If you're watching on Facebook Live, this is a um, webinar that requires pre-registration. So folks will be joining the webinar here. If you want to um, participate in the conversation on Facebook Live, feel free to write your comments in the comment box and um, I'll take a look at those as soon as the presentation is over and I'll be sure to answer any questions that you might have. For those folks that are joining us today, I have disabled the chat function, but feel free to utilize the Q&A to ask questions during the presentation. And we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. I hope you're all here for our Climate Smart Floridians webinar series. Um, if you haven't joined us in the past, that's fine. Um, you can jump right in. This is the fifth of a six-part series, so next week is going to be our last um, presentation, but hopefully we'll be doing another um, set of classes with the libraries um, in the near future. I think we've had a lot of um, good feedback from this series and it's a nice way to kind of tie into some of our uh, local communities related to to climate change issues so let's see we're about one minute away from start time it's about start time now so i'm gonna go ahead and let um, kim barber who's from manatee county libraries go ahead and give us an introduction and then i will get started with my presentation kim Hello, hi, I'm Kim. I'm with the library and while we are open to a limited capacity, we're still offering a lot of programs online like this one. Um, if you look at our website or Facebook page, you'll see everything that we have ready. We're going to have real-time programs. We also have on-demand programs like escape rooms and puzzles that are available to all of our patrons. So I'll hand this back to Alyssa. All right, thank you so much, Kim. This has been a really great um, opportunity for us to work together on a um, collaborative offering, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of these in the future. Uh, so to start off, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Alyssa Vinson. I am the residential horticulture agent at the Manatee County Extension Office. And if you are unfamiliar with Extension, I just wanna give a quick introduction to who we are. Um, we are a function of the land-grant university system. And here in Florida, there are two land-grant universities, the University of Florida and the Florida Agricultural Mechanical University, FAMU. And our goal as an organization is to provide research-based research education to our communities. And we don't want to just kind of take the facts and figures and hand them to you, right? It's our job to um, make them accessible and relevant to your daily lives. And in doing so, we want to enhance the quality of life um, for everyone in our community. There are 67 extension offices uh, scattered throughout the state in every county. And each office kind of has different programs that they offer. Um, in Manatee County, we have... Um, a wide variety of program areas. Um, I manage our residential horticulture program, master gardener volunteer program, as well as the master naturalist program. Um, and we have folks that specifically work on marine resources. We have uh, commercial hor horticulture as well as commercial agriculture and livestock. We have folks that work specifically with youth in our 4-H program. We also have um, individuals who focus on things like um, 
money management and nutrition. So we really do touch on almost every aspect of our community. And when we look at um, how we impact our community, some of the, the recent impacts from last year that we like to highlight involve over $2 million in value of new licenses and CEUs provided to license holders in Manatee County, over $860,000 in value for our volunteer time. And that that is, I'm, I'm very proud um, of our Master Gardener volunteer program. We have over 109 volunteers and they donate over 10,000 hours every year to providing um, educational programs to the community. Over 28,000 youth were educated through the 4-H Youth Development Program, and we had over 14 millions of get million gallons of water saved to Manatee County Utilities customers through various um, water conservation programs that we have in the office. So I think you can see that we, we really um, provide a lot of impacts in our community, and we're here as a resource for you. Climate Smart, specifically, was developed um, by the Florida Sea Grant Climate Work Action Team, and its goal is to increase climate literacy and, and reduce local greenhouse gas emissions um, at the household level. So when we talk about climate change, we recognize that it's a, it's a really big topic, and a lot of people feel a little overwhelmed when, when we start talking about solutions to climate change or adaptations to climate change. And so um, Sea Grant tried to work together to, to break it down into some really actionable um, steps that could be taken at the personal level. So that's Climate Smart. Today we're going to be talking specifically about water and water resources. And some of the key learning points that we want to take away from today's discussion are that um, water shortages are already common in many areas of the U.S. and throughout the world. Um, these shortages are projected to increase uh, as one of the major consequences of climate change. Now, where those shortages are located may shift from historical um, areas that are more prone to drought because of the shifting climate patterns. Uh, the energy used to produce, distribute, and dispose of water uh, results in greenhouse gas emissions. As we've talked in, in previous classes, um, you know, anytime you transport something, you're going to have associated greenhouse gases. And water is one of the things, it's very heavy and it's transported um, long distances. And so there are a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that are just associated with the transportation of water. Um, and then conserving water, both inside and outside of the home, is a really easy way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help optimize our water supply and conserve it for future water shortages. <clears throat> so what is the situation? Well, when we look at trends in population and freshwater withdrawals, we can see that our population is growing pretty, um, pretty drastically, especially here in Florida. We know we have... Um, you know, tens of thousands of, of new people moving to the state every week. And those people need water. They need water to drink, but they also need water to flush their toilets, wash their hands, water their lawns. Um, and so <clears throat> those withdrawals um, kind of... Uh, they, they ratchet up with population, but you can see here that we actually... There's less water... Um, that, that's actually being withdrawn now. And that has something to do with um, water efficiency measures. And so that's a good thing. Um, but one of the concerns also is that some of this reduction in withdrawal may be attributable to uh, just a lack of water to withdraw. Um, so this graph here doesn't really divvy out those, those um, those two realities. So we know that more people need more water, um, but we also know that there's been an increase in efficiency in water usage, um, but there's also less groundwater available for withdrawal, particularly in the coastal communities in Florida, where we tend to have a lot of um, issues with saltwater intrusion. And if you think about a, a county like Pinellas County, they actually don't have any option for um, groundwater withdrawals. And so they rely entirely on um, you know, surrounding counties to, to provide them their water and transport their water into, into that county. So um, here in Florida, it, things get particularly um, tricky 
And, and there are a lot of different ways that we manage water, right? Um, water isn't free, but it's pretty close to free for people who are just kind of using it at home. Your tap water, if you really look at, um, you know, you, if you look at your utility bill and, and you look at that cost for that um, potable, clean water, it's very, very, very cheap. And there's been some discussion about the fact that um, the cost of water does not accurately represent its overall cost from an environmental perspective. So <clears throat> water, like we said earlier, it, there's a lot of greenhouse gases associated with the withdrawal of water, either from um, groundwater source or even from a surface water source. That water has to be transported to a treatment facility. The um, energy required in a treatment facility can be fairly intensive. Then you have water being moved from that treatment facility to the end user. And so all of that transportation requires energy, requires electricity. And then when it gets to the end user, that water is going to be um, potentially heated or uh, moved throughout the house in some way. And so... <clears throat> So we have to think about how we're using that water at the end and, and how it's extracted at the beginning and wrap all those costs up together to recognize that, that we really, we, we get a pretty good deal on, on our water, um, but water resources are rapidly declining. So even though we live in this um, water rich state, right, if you you, you know, Florida is known for its wetlands and swamps, um, for our coastal resources, uh, but we do have water shortages here in Florida. And as we, as our population continues to increase, it's likely that we will have um, more drains on our water resources. Um, the image here down at the bottom just kind of shows you how climate change increases the occurrence of droughts, floods, higher temperatures. Um, you, know, you talk about things like increased intensity and frequency of Atlantic hurricanes. Um, and so those types of events can lead to higher water demand. If there's higher water demand, there is more energy used to transport that water and to clean that water. And then we have an increase in greenhouse gas emissions, and that increase in greenhouse gas emissions helps to fuel climate change. So unfortunately, there's kind of this, this feedback loop um, with water resources. And so it's really important here when we look at that, what is the, what is the kind of key here in this feedback loop that we have control over. And, and, you know, we can look, we can see a couple of things that we can really control, right? We can control that demand. Are there conservation measures that we can take to lessen that demand? And what can we do on the energy perspective as far as efficiency in, in water transport and water treatment? <clears throat> So when we talk about a diminishing resource, um, sometimes it's hard to see it here in Florida because we do have such um, a seeming abundance of, of water around us. Um, but you know, when we think about diminishing water resources, I think when we, when we picture kind of the American West, in particular, um, like the Colorado River and the Delta, uh, there at the, at the end of the Colorado River, where there has been significant decline in that water um, over the last 10, 20 years, um, it becomes a little bit more easy to visualize what this looks like, right? Um, a 2019 study by the U.S. Forest Service has estimated that by 2071, about half of the freshwater basins in the U.S. aren't going to be able to meet monthly water demands. Um, most municipalities across the country are already experiencing some kind of water shortage, whether seasonally or constantly, and they have had to institute water use restrictions. Counties and cities in Florida already have water restrictions, um, and you can find uh, your local water restrictions by going to your water management district's website. Here I have listed the Southwest Florida Water Management District because that's the um, district that we are in here in the Tampa Bay area. If you're outside of our area, um, just go to the um, just go to 
uh, your Google search bar and type in Florida Water Management Districts, and it'll pull up a map and you'll be able to select which management district you fall under so that you can see what your um, water restrictions are. For, the, for most people, it's going to be um, something where you can only water on, you know, two days a week if you have this address, et cetera, et cetera. So, so look those up, um, find out what your water restrictions are. So, you know, when we talk about water conservation, techniques to help us conserve water to lower the um, greenhouse gases associated with that water use, it's important for us to discuss how we use water. So when we're talking about freshwater withdrawals, this is from 2010, so it's 10 years old, um, but uh, it's, it's fairly similar to what we have now. When we look at across the entire country, about 45% of our freshwater withdrawals are actually used to generate electricity. Um, and then 32% is used for irrigation, and that's going to be agricultural irrigation. 12% um, then is public supply. So that's the water that's coming to us. So we really can have an impact on that 12%, right? Um, it's, it's not likely that our individual choices or actions are going to have um, a drastic impact on the thermoelectric power or the irrigation aspect. But um, that 12% that is the public supply, we can really um, have a major impact on, on how much demand there is in the, in the public supply section. <clears throat> so when that water gets to us, how do, how do we use it at that end user um, in our homes? Uh, so when we look at indoor water use, the average American household, so there could be multiple people in the household, but the average American household is going to use about 300 gallons of water per day. And this is a staggering number. Um, you know, when you think about how we get our water and, um, you know, when you think about people in other parts of the world that maybe have to transport their water um, to their homes rather than having a municipal system that brings it to them, and, you, and each gallon of water is eight pounds, right? Imagine having to carry 300 gallons of water to your home every day. Um, I don't think we would use so much water if we did. Um, but of that water, um, that we use, about 30% of it is used for landscapes. And we'll talk specifically about landscapes and we'll do even more of a deep dive into landscapes in our, our last class. Um, but 30% of that is gonna go to kind of your landscape uses. 70% of that is gonna go to indoor uses. And that's broken down here so that you can see um, toilets are about um, 24 percent, showers are 20 percent, and faucets, I apologize for the typo there, faucets are 19 percent. So there's, there's a fairly, um, fairly even split here between um, these uses. It's not, it's not um, you know, like toilets use way more water than our faucets do. We, we split it out pretty evenly between our toilets, showers, and faucets. So uh, I just wanted to pause for a second and talk about, okay, so we've got the, this water, this 300 gallons of water that comes to our home and how we think about its impact on climate change is related to the associated greenhouse gases. So how are greenhouse gases associated with water? Um, and I know I've mentioned it before, but transportation is really the biggest way that, um, that water it affects greenhouse gases. So when you have water that's coming from far away and it has to be transported, that's going to take energy. And uh, for the most part, municipalities that are providing water do a really good job of um, utilizing gravity as much as possible to, to make their systems more efficient, but you can't get around the fact that it takes a lot of energy to move water. Again, it is, it's very heavy. Um, water treatment, again, too, is going to require an energy input, so that energy is going to be uh, in the form of electricity, and as we talked about in a previous class, um, our electricity here in the state of Florida is most um, most of our electricity comes from natural gas and oil being burned. And so that, that is um, a 
major contribution to greenhouse gases. We heat our water in our homes, and so um, that requires a lot of electricity as well. So in order to take showers, take baths, wash dishes, do our laundry, we have to heat that water. And so um, finding methods to maybe increase the efficiency of our uh, water heating is certainly um, a good goal as well. And then uh, irrigation. Um, and irrigation can lead to greenhouse gas emissions in, in a couple of ways, but um, depending on when you're irrigating, how you're irrigating, whether you're also fertilizing, there can be some um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with um, the water and how it interacts with the soil. Um, so there could be some greenhouse gas emissions associated there as well. So <clears throat> I want to pause for a second and talk about water from a consumption perspective. And our last class, we talked specifically about consumption, about the purchasing of goods, right? And um, one of the things that I really wanted to, us to kind of talk about specifically today is tap water versus bottled water. And, you know, we're, we're, we're in hurricane season now in Florida, and I think about this every year. Um, people like to buy a lot of bottled water for hurricanes. And I've always wondered why people don't fill up containers with tap water that's essentially free. Um, when you when you consider the cost of bottled water versus filling containers with tap water, it's always just seemed astronomical to me that you would you would go out and, and purchase bottles of water when you could when you could save it in containers. Um, but some people um, feel like bottled water is safer, and I think it's really important to address that misconception and say that for the most part, despite some um, outliers, your tap water is going to be just as safe, if not safer than bottled water. And so, um, you know, kind of getting away from that mindset that somehow this bottled water is better for me. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about things like vitamin water and, um, or, or not, not specifically vitamin water, but, but ways that, ways that um, companies find, uh, innovative um, opportunities to sell us water, right? So this water is better than this other water because of this thing, or this is the purest of the pure water. Um, so you should only drink this water because it's so pure. Um, and it's going to cost five times as much as that other water. Um, so so when, when we look at bottled water, it takes three liters of water to produce a single liter of bottled water. So not only is bottled water more expensive, it's also more water intensive. So how can we kind of improve this relationship um, with the tap versus, versus the bottle? I opt almost exclusively to ditch the single use water bottles completely, right? I avoid plastic water bottles as much as possible. I have refillable water bottles. I probably have way too many. <laughs> um, they end up rolling around in the bottom of the car for who knows how many months, but it keeps me from buying bottled water because I always have a water bottle around and I can fill it at a sink or um, a water fountain. If you don't like the taste of your water, and that's the reason that you're purchasing water, you can get a water filtering device for your home that'll improve your tap water quality. And these are um, really simple. They can be everything from like a $5 carbon filter all the way up to uh, multiple hundreds of dollars kind of in-home plumbed in system. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> these will help remove any kind of off tastes out of your tap water that, that you don't like, um, and maybe you'll drink your tap water a little bit more frequently. And I think that you would find that the purchase of one kind of water filtering device would be offset um, when you think about how much money you're spending on bottled water. 
Uh, support the placement of water fountains in public places, especially those with the water bottle fillers. Those are the best. You walk up and you just hold out your water bottle and, and it fills it up. Um, so if you can encourage your employer um, or the places that you frequent to, to put those in, that, that really gets people utilizing those um, refillable containers more often. If you do use um, plastic or um, disposable water containers, avoid using the small six to eight ounce size because there's gonna be more of them that you consume and more waste produced. Make sure that you drink it to the last drop. Don't discard half full bottles of water. What a waste, clean water. Um, reuse the bottle if you can. You know, I know some people will get a, um, a single use plastic water bottle and they can reuse it multiple times before they, before they finally recycle it. Um, and so that's a good option too. And then when, when, you've, when you've gotten to the very end, the bottle's all crinkled up, you can't quite get the cap on anymore, then, you, then is the option to recycle that bottle and, and make sure that, that it's getting into the correct receptacle um, and, and if you, know, you need to worry about single stream versus uh, mixed, make sure that you place it in the correct container so that it gets recycled appropriately. So that's just a little um, aside on tap versus bottle. Now, when we talk about bottled water, I think it's important when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about um, water resources to take a second to talk about the private use of public water. Um, and, and this has been, you know, a topic that has been in the news recently and has been um, contested in different kinds of uh, laws throughout you know, the history of the United States. What does it mean? This is the, you know, in an environmental science, this is the tragedy of the commons, right? How do you allow a private individual or a private company to utilize a public resource in a way that is equitable? Um, do you have to make it equitable? Um, is it important to do so? Um, and, and this kind of came up in the news recently with, um, Ginny Springs and a uh, company was trying to pull water um, out of Ginny Springs to, um, you know, they, they do it. They, they pull water out of Ginny Springs and, and bottle it and, and sell it. And they wanted to increase the amount of water they could withdraw from the spring. And so um, a lot of people opposed it. A lot of people were for it. I encourage you to go out and read some of the information that's available on both sides of the issue um, because it, it, it's, it's really an interesting topic. You have something that everybody needs to live, right, which is water. We have shortages of it seasonally here in Florida. Our springs are one of the um, most important from an economic perspective, uh, natural resources that we have in the state. And so um, there's a lot, of, a lot of facets that go into how do we protect this water, this natural resource in a way that also protects the, the rights of this private individual, this private company? Um, how do we encourage the you know, economy of, of, of the local area um, where the spring is located, and, and really what is the, the value of water? How do we put a price on how important water is to us? Um, and there are lots of different methods for, for figuring out that value, but I think, um, you know, when we recognize water not just as a consumable good, but also as a valuable recreational resource um, and, and habitat resource and, um, you know, it provides many different environmental services that also have associated values, I think that we, we can begin to see that water really is much more valuable than, than we tend to, to treat it. And so, um, so again, I, I think that here in Florida, um, in particular, with some of the impacts we're going to see from climate change, this will be an issue that we continue to talk about. Um, there is some discussion about septic systems versus sewer systems as far as efficiency is concerned. So sewers account for about 2% of all the energy use in the United States. So the movement of sewage um, and the treatment of sewage accounts for 2% of total energy use. So there are associated greenhouse gases um, with that 
uh, system. Septic systems do use less energy. They're less greenhouse gas intensive, but they can lead to a lot of pollution concerns, particularly in our coastal environments. So in areas that are susceptible to flooding um, and erosion as the result of things like hurricanes, which we know um, based on the on this available science will be increasing in their frequency and intensity over, um, over the years as we deal with climate change, we have to think about, okay, is a septic system really going to make sense in this situation? Um, how can we balance the, um, the energy use related to sewers and, um, and the potential water quality impacts from septic systems. So those are some things to consider. If you're you know, in the process of building a new home or maybe you have a septic system and you're thinking about um, uh, you know, transferring it over to a, a sewage system. So how are drought and climate related? Um, and this is a really good thing to ponder because drought is very analogous to climate in that it is the, um, the aggregate of, of um, available water over a very long period of time. So we're looking at averages. We're not looking at individual um, events. And so this is from today. Um, or I should say from two days ago, July 14th, two days ago. This is the drought map of the United States. And you can find this uh, here at droughtmonitor.unl.edu. Um, and so you can see areas where you have kind of generally you would expect extreme drought. Um, so some areas of the, of the West um, where we have uh, in general, less rainfall um, this time of year, high heat. Um, and so uh, here in Florida, uh, we're not showing on the USDA map as being in a drought um, because we're in, in our rainy season, right? But we all know, um, having lived in Florida, if you've lived in Florida for a little while, that, um, that we go through seasonal changes. We have a dry season and a wet season. Um, climate change is changing seasonal drought patterns, seasonal rainfall patterns. Um, and so some areas may have more rain than they would historically, and other areas will have less. So something that we might see with our drought maps is a shifting of where these areas of extreme drought are occurring. Um, so that's something to consider. And, you know, as we think about water resources, particularly here in Florida, um, you know, it's important to recognize that also as sea levels rise, we may not have extreme drought in Florida, but our coastal communities are going to be affected by the influx of salt water into our groundwater system. Um, so uh, we may not have extreme drought, but we will still have um, uh, freshwater supply shortages. So that's a little bit on focusing on kind of indoor water use and greenhouse gas emissions and, and water supply shortages. I want to focus now a little bit on outdoor water use. And this map uh, from NASA, they had a project where they um, used satellite data to try to map all of the um, fractional turf grass area in in the country. And so when you when you look at this map, you can see obviously, you know, lawns kind of aggregate in these areas of um, population. And so I think I think that we would all agree that maybe right in the urban core, we don't have large expansive lawns or or lots of lawns even but as we move out into the hinterlands around that urban core and into the suburbs we get um, a lot of lawns and if you look at Florida um, Florida is very uh, very covered in lawns, especially eat along the southwest coast and, and, and even on the southeast coast. So um, we actually have over 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. And this is all, um, for the most part, an irrigated lawn surface. So 
when we talk about outdoor water use, our residential outdoor water use is about 9 billion gallons a year. Um, and most of that water that those residences are using, you know, we talked about, uh, well, I should say about 30% um, of, of what we get uh, as individuals in our home is going to go towards outdoor water use. So, so this represents that, that 9 billion gallons a year is going to irrigate our landscapes. So how can we make better choices um, about what we're doing in our landscape in order to conserve water? Well, uh, you're talking to the, um, you know, residential horticulture agent from the extension office. So I'm going to tell you that you should check out our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Um, and Florida Friendly Landscaping has nine principles, and most of them are centered around how to either protect our water resources from a conservation perspective, or how do we protect our water resources from a water quality perspective. <clears throat> we have um, a couple of programs in our office <clears throat> in Manatee County um, where we will actually help you analyze kind of your soil, uh, soil sample results and uh, look at your landscape and help you make more informed Florida friendly choices related to your landscape. We also have in our office um, through partnership with uh, County Utilities, the Mobile Irrigation Lab program, which includes a rebate where you can have your landscape evaluated and um, if you make changes associated with that evaluation to conserve water, um, you can receive a rebate. So uh, check us out, go to floridayards.org, um, visit our Manatee County webpage, uh, call us, ask questions about our mobile irrigation lab. We're here to help you make informed choices about water conservation in the landscape. And our next session of this uh, webinar series, our last session, is really going to focus on uh, specifically landscape and um, some of the climate considerations centered around landscape. So not just water, um, but also things like maintenance, invasive species, pollinators, things like that. So what can you do, right? The whole purpose of the Climate Smart Program is to help you identify uh, ways that you can change some of your behaviors to lower your greenhouse gas emissions. So. For, um, for irrigation, for your landscape, think about things like smart watering, water to the weather. If it's going to rain in the afternoon, you know it's going to rain, don't let your irrigation system run. For the most part, um, you know, we've, we've had kind of a hot and dry month here, but for the most part, um, you can generally turn off your automated irrigation system this time of year uh, because we're getting enough rain uh, to, to water your landscape. Um, you can also build a rain barrel to take advantage of that rain and then use that rain barrel water to irrigate your landscape. Use uh, micro irrigation or drip systems. These are going to be the most efficient way to get water onto your landscape. They deliver the water directly to the root system and they um, uh, they don't have as much associated uh, evaporation. If you are going to use kind of an overhead sprinkler system, consider getting um, a soil moisture sensor or a sensor that can account for evapotranspiration. Um, you should have a rain sensor. Um, at the very least, you are required by law to have a rain um, shutoff device. So if you have an in-ground irrigation system, make sure that your rain shutoff device is functional. If you're hand watering, water at the roots. Don't just spray the hose over the top of all the plants. Water at the roots. Um, this again is for efficiency and conservation, but this is also healthy for your plants. Um, and make sure that you're watering at the right time of day. You know, I, I know sometimes um, you're home at lunch, you water the plants. That's better than not watering them ever for the health of the plant, um, but you, that's really not the most efficient time to water your plants. Ideally, you want to water your plants just before sunrise. They can um, have an opportunity to use that water um, before the sun gets up and gets hot um, and evaporates a lot of that water. Um, and avoid watering in windy conditions. If it's very windy, uh, you know, 
shut your system off, let the wind kind of die down, and then go ahead and use that overhead sprinkler. As far as indoor water use, there are many ways that you can conserve water um, uh, inside, but these are just a few uh, that have a really big impact. So number one is just turning off the tap. So when you are brushing your teeth, turn off the tap. Um, when you are, um, you know, if you need to wash a dish, soap it, rinse it, turn the water off, right? Um, don't keep the water running. If you turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth, you can save 200 gallons per month. So that's, that's not an insignificant amount of water. And remember that, that every um, gallon of water you can save has associated greenhouse gases that you are also reducing. Um, there has been research that has shown that dishwashers are in fact more efficient than hand washing. So <clears throat> um, I, I, um, I remember for a long time really feeling very strongly that I could be better at washing my dishes than the dishwasher could. I could use less water. Um, but it turns out, in fact, no, I can't beat a machine. Uh, I'm not John Henry. Um, <clears throat> and that dishwashers are more efficient than hand washing. Um, if you um, rinse your dishes before putting them in the dishwasher, that does add a significant amount of water. So what you can do instead of using the tap to rinse every dish, maybe you can get a, a large Tupperware container or a bucket that you place in the sink, you fill that with water, and then you rinse your dishes in there before putting them in the dishwasher so you're not constantly running the water if you need to rinse them. Also, scraping that material, um, and, and in particular, uh, putting it into a compost system rather than running it through the garbage disposal. Garbage disposals use a lot of water too because you have to run the water the whole time the garbage disposal is working. And then I challenge everybody to see if they can take a five-minute shower. I, I'm sure you can do it. If you have small children at home, you probably have like the 30-second shower um, down at this point. Um, but definitely uh, try to limit your shower usage. Get a more efficient um, faucet or uh, shower head as well. So here again, um, some additional low cost solutions. So there are some things that will take, um, cost a little bit more money. When we talk about water efficiency, you know, we could talk about things like um, uh, getting a solar hot water heater, right? That's gonna lessen the amount of greenhouse gas emissions associated with your, your water heating needs, right? But that's kind of a, a large amount of money that you have to outlay to get that in place. So some low cost solutions that can be really impactful are things like low flow devices. So that's for shower heads, faucets, um, for toilets as well. Uh, reuse potable water where you can. I know that I try really hard if I'm like washing vegetables, rinsing fruit, uh, things like that, even rinsing off dishes. I will, I'll take that water that I, that rinse water that I'm using and I'll water plants in, in the garden with, with that water. So um, try to reuse that potable water if you can. Turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. Remember we talked about that. You can save up to 200 gallons per month just by turning off the tap when you brush your teeth. Rather than using your hose to spray off your porch or your gutters, sweep it out. Um, use a good old broom and dustpan. Um, they have, I know, lots of really neat devices that you can use to help clean out your gutters at this point. Um, but don't, don't use your hose because that uses a lot of water. Uh, if you wash your car, it's better to do so at a commercial car wash because they actually recycle that water for the most part. So um, a lot of that water is going to run off into underground drains and they're actually going to recycle that water. So if, um, again, if you're washing your car, uh, try to do so at a commercial car wash. And then use a rain barrel. Um, we can capture hundreds of gallons of water in a single rainfall event um, here in Florida. I think we all know we get some pretty significant downpours. And um, so we have the opportunity there to capture that rainwater and then to reuse it in the landscape. Um, you know, it's recommended because it's running off of a roof and there are potential chemicals that are running off with that water, not to use it to water, um, your vegetable plants or things that you're going to consume right away, but watering anything else in your landscape is going to be perfectly fine with that 
Rain Barrel. Um, and we have classes uh, devoted to the building of rain barrels and the use of rain barrels. So keep your eyes out for upcoming rain barrel classes. If you have the option to kind of start at the ground level or influence policymakers within your community, something that you can encourage is low impact development. And low impact development is going to help conserve water more at a community level than at an individual level. So one of the very first things that we can try to encourage people to do is to conserve green space. Um, and this doesn't mean have fast lawns everywhere. This means when we're developing, we want to um, keep as much of that land in its natural state as possible. In particular, um, if we have things like embedded wetlands, um, we want to make sure that we're doing as little as possible to disrupt the natural processes that are occurring in those environments. So conserving green space first, right? Those natural soils, they're going to absorb runoff. We have a lot of water filtration capacity there. Um, and so that, that's a really good kind of first best option is to conserve that green space. If you need to uh, create a hard surface, um, try to select permeable pavement. Um, these surfaces allow stormwater to percolate through them, going into the soil so that they don't just sheet off into a uh, stormwater system. Um, installing green or eco roof systems, uh, this is potentially an option. It's a challenge here in Florida um, for green roofs to be particularly successful because of our very hot and dry, um, or our, I should say our very hot and wet and then our very dry season. Um, it's hard to find plants that can survive in those harsh um, uh, harsh environments, um, but they, they can be an option um, if you select your plants carefully and you are working kind of from the beginning to, to get them to be as strong as they need to be to support all of that material. The really great thing about green roofs is, is if you can do it, not only are they capturing rainwater um, and, and conserving that water in the home landscape, they're also lowering your energy bill um, because they add a significant level of um, insulation. Um, building bioretention basins and rain gardens. So this is kind of like the next step up from rain barrel, right? Let's say that you have a uh, Maybe you have a low spot in your yard, it, it tends to collect water, um, or uh, you would like to build a rain garden, you can, you can create a depressional area in your landscape. But this is a vegetated depression that has plants that can handle being wet and dry, that's going to collect and filter your storm water rather than having it run off your landscape um, into the broader stormwater system. So all of these, um, you know, low impact development has been around for a long time. And so the more we can kind of build the, the conversation around it and, and encourage people to consider these strategies, the, the better off um, our communities will be from a water conservation and water quality perspective. And that is what I have for you today. Here are some resources if you're interested in finding more about um, uh, water sense or water star or energy star um, you can uh, google ifis and rain barrel and it'll pull up a lot of information for you on how to uh, build a rain barrel how to use it also check out your water footprint calculator i encourage everybody to go and and kind of work through these calculators and um, kind of find out what is your individual water footprint are you like the average american are you using 300 gallons a day or are you using less? Um, and like I said, we do have a, um, a rebate system here in Manatee County. It's our mobile irrigation lab. So contact our office and find out more about that if you're interested in getting a landscape evaluation um, and to see if you can make some changes to your landscape irrigation in order to um, get that rebate. The Climate Smart Curriculum was originally developed by the Sea Grant Climate Action Team. 
Um, here is their contact information if you have questions about the curriculum. And then here's all the references which I can make available to you if you are interested. And again, for those of you that were watching on Facebook Live, if you have any questions or comments, I will address those after the presentation has concluded. Um, otherwise, I'm open for questions if anybody wants to type some in the Q&A. I'll give you a couple seconds to do so. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn for the day. And um, I look forward to seeing you all next week where we'll be doing a deep dive into landscapes and um, their impact on climate change and how climate change is going to impact landscapes. All right, thank you so much.